Welcome to the short demonstration of Westwind Web Search. Web Search is a small utility you can use to capture HTTP requests and then play them back either individually or under heavy load for web stress testing. The goal of this utility is to make it drop dead easy to create sessions that you can easily save and share and put into source control so that you have an easy environment to create tests and then run them repeatedly. Let's see what this looks like. When you start up Westwind Web Search for the first time, you come up to an empty environment. Web Search is based on the concept of sessions, which is a collection of HTTP requests that make up a web load test. So a number of URLs exist inside of that, and we can create these new requests by clicking either on the new button here to manually create a request, use the capture form to capture HTTP requests from a browser or a Windows application, or by opening a session that was previously saved. These sessions are nothing more than text files that you can manually edit, or you can save them through the request editor here. You can also generate these sessions from tools like Fiddler. Okay, so let's go ahead and create a new session. So let's start with a local URL on my local site here, and I'm gonna point it at my local web log, which is my development site for my web log. A HTTP request is made up of an HTTP verb, the actual URL that you're going to hit, and any number of headers that are attached to that particular request. If you have a post and put operation, you can also put HTTP content in there. So then I can save that request and it shows up in this list over here. I can then click the test button here to actually test that request and see what the actual response is from the server. So we can look at the actual request data and the request headers that were sent to that URL. And we can see the HTTP response, which in this case is an okay and then all the headers that were returned. We can also look at the HTTP response body that was returned, and in this case, it's HTML, and it shows up as formatted HTML here. So certain response types, HTML, XML, and JSON, are automatically formatted so that they're easy to view. If you rather look at the raw response, you can click this button, and you will get the exact response that was sent from the server. You can also click the viewer button to see the HTML response represented in the browser. So this can be useful if you need to look at things like error messages or you actually need to parse the HTML that is there. So at this point, we have a session with a single request. Let's add another request to it. So I'm going to copy an existing request by using the copy from request option, which copies all of the information from the current request to a new request. And then all I have to do is rename it to something new. So now I have two requests here. Okay, so now we have two requests and I can actually start running a stress test. A stress test needs to know how many seconds to run for and how many simultaneous clients to use it. So when we start running this, we'll notice right away that there is a problem here. And the reason is, is that I actually gave it an invalid URL. So what we see here is the console showing me the requests that are running and how long they're taking, and then also a running total down here at the bottom that shows me how many requests and how many failed. And obviously, there's a very large number of failures in here. So let me stop this, and we can actually look at some of the requests that have come through. So we can see here in the results list, we see the requests that failed, and we can click on them and then actually see the error. And clearly, it's a 404 not found error. So let's go back to the session and I realize now that this should have been posts. So now to make sure that this actually works, I should probably test the URL. So I click the test button and now I can see I get a valid response back. Okay, let's rerun the test now. So now we can see all 200 requests and we're not getting any errors, great. On the bottom here, we still see that running total now and it's all green because there are no errors. So it gives us the number of requests that have been processed, how many have failed, how long the test has been running and how long there is to go, and then kind of a running total of the requests per second that have been processed. Now at any point in time of that the test is running, I can click the stop button to get to the test results view. The actual test results then show me the total number of requests that were fired for how long it ran and then how many requests a second it took. On the bottom here, you can see a list of all the URLs in the test and how many of them had successful and failed responses. And it also gives us some statistics about the longest and shortest request and the average request time. So that's essentially single request running. If you need to capture many requests, then the URL capture form is a better way to go. To do this, click on the capture button here and then bring up the URL capture form, which allows you to capture HTTP requests from your browser on the local machine or any Windows application that goes through the Windows proxy. 
in order to do this, click the capture button to start and then bring up your browser. So I'm going to go to a URL here. I'm going to go to my time tracker web, which is another sample application here on the local machine. And I'm going to go to the entry browser. So I'm going to browse around, select one item, and then update an item, which is a post operation. And then go to click on the time report and again, change the value here, run a report, which is another post operation. So we've gone through a few steps here and I'm going to stop the capture at this point. So I'm going to go with save to actually save what I just did here and call that time tracker test. I'm going to close the window and if we go back to the session window now, we can see that we've captured a ton of requests here. Most of the information inside of here, unfortunately, is not something that we're really interested in. If you look closely here, you see a bunch of Google links, which is actually from the Google Chrome uh, search box in this case. Um, there's some localhost connection links, which are also from Google Chrome that have to do with the dev tools. And there's a bunch of stuff that is related to scripts and images and CSS files, which while useful, we typically don't want to actually stress test. We know those things are static files and they serve fast. What we're really interested in is just the actual HTTP request that the application generate. How do we deal with that? Well, we could go in and delete all the things that we're not interested in. So if I go back to the top here, I can pick out all the links that I'm really not interested in and press delete. I can pick the image links and select and delete, but that's obviously pretty tedious. So let's take another approach. Let me close this session file and let's go back to the capture window. You can actually set some filters here. So I'm going to say I only want to capture from localhost and um, I also want to ignore images, CSS and JavaScript links. So this is a filter that's configurable that looks at certain extensions and automatically excludes them. Let's go in and retry this again. So I'm going to click the capture button and we'll go back to the browser and let's go back to localhost time tracker web. So there's my page. Uh, I'm going to go in and click the entry browser, click on a link there, post the operation, wait for it to complete, go to the time report and run the report as a post operation. Stop the capture, save it to disk again, to the same time tracker web, close it out, and lo and behold, we have a much cleaner request session this time. We only get the links that we're actually interested in, which are the actual application links. So I'm gonna save that. And then while we're here, I also wanna show you real quick what this file looks like. So this is a session file that we've just created. And you can see it here on the bottom. So it's a session file and it's called time tracker .web search. You can edit that file and that file is just a text file of all the HTTP traces plus the session settings, which are at the very bottom. But these files are just plain HTTP traces of headers, which is in the same format as tools like Fiddler export. The other interesting thing is that once you've created these files, you can also go in and make changes in this text file here and save that. So as soon as I save that, it shows up over here. And then also if I make a change to this here and save it, and actually we go over here and look at the actual value, you can see that they're updated in the real request editor. So any changes made to the text file are automatically reflected back into the session list. So if I make that change back here and we'll take it back out and save, we'll see that reflected immediately over here. Sometimes it's useful to use the text file if you're making bulk changes or you need to do a search and replace operation that actually makes it easier in the editor to do. Now that we've generated our session, we're ready to run another stress test. As before, we need to specify how many seconds to run the test for and then also how many simultaneous HTTP requests to fire. So I'm gonna choose 15 here, which is a relatively low number, but keep in mind that web search actually generates requests one after the other by default. There's no delay timeout between individual requests. If you want to simulate more typical user interactions, you might want to put a delay timeout between each request. In this case, I'm looking for load characteristics of the application, so I'm trying to load it up as much as possible and see how much it takes before it breaks. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and hit the start button. And as before, the console comes up and we'll see the running request running on the right here. So the test runs for 20 seconds, and once it's done, it shows us the test results just as before. Okay, so in this case, it didn't generate any errors, so there were no timeouts or everything ran. And we can see here that it generated 13,000 requests in 
and 685 requests a second, which is pretty good given this application is an ASP.NET application hitting SQL Server and generating a fair amount of HTML on the front end. You can also look at the individual requests and see the actual output that was generated. If we do have errors, then you can pull them up and there is actually one here. And there was one request that actually timed out at the very end, it looks like. So if we look at the actual output here, we should have one request that shows up in this list. So here's the summary of all the URLs and here's our one failure at the bottom. So if we look at that again, we can look at the detail here and we'll see that this particular request never actually returns, so we don't have a response, but we can see which request it was that was actually failing. We can also look at the request per second in a chart form so we can see what the load characteristics of the applications are over time. Likewise, if you go to the results, uh, let me pull up the all again, you can look at individual URLs and see their time taken per the URL. You can also export the results into text files of various formats. So you can export into XML, JSON, and the web search raw HTTP format. So all of these exports take all of the data that is available and export it out into text files. So if you need to run some analytics on this, you can do that. The web search format itself is uh, just the raw text format, which is plain text of HTTP traces. So here's what that looks like. If you open this up, um, you'll see the raw HTTP headers. So here's the headers. Here in this case is the post buffer for this post request. And here's the HTTP response headers and the actual response body. If we scroll down a little bit, We'll see the next request right here, another post operation uh, with the body, and then here is the response. Now these files get very big very, very quickly, so you wanna be careful. So let me demonstrate here. To export this 13,000 request trace into a JSON file generates a file that is 152K big. So if you run this test for a long time, like let's say an hour, you're going to get a very, very large JSON file, and you want to be careful where you load this into. So these exports are great for exporting to some other format like Excel so that you can run further analytics on the data. So far, we've only used relatively low volume requests. So let's open up another project here or another session that has a few more high volume requests with it. So I'm going to use an API project here. And um, some of these requests, most of these requests, in fact, are JSON requests for a, an Ajax front end application. So you can see here, we're asking for JSON data and we're getting a JSON response back. So what you notice here is that the HTTP response is automatically formatted to JSON, which is of course much nicer than the raw response that you would otherwise see. So HTML, XML, and JSON output is automatically formatted, which is kind of nice. So if we want to test some of these URLs here in bulk, we can just run this test and we'll notice we'll get about 700, maybe close to 800 requests a second, which is pretty much what we would expect given that this application is an ASP.NET API application that's hitting a SQL Server database and returning in some cases some fairly large volumes of data. So we see here 700 requests a second, that's pretty good, but that's still not really high volume. Let's go back to our session and let's pick some individual URLs. So I'm gonna select everything and I'm gonna to toggle them all to disabled with control I, or I can go to the toggle active state. So at this point, I'm gonna take the hello world request here, which is basically a very simple request that simply returns a JSON string as part of an object. So let's run that request, which doesn't hit the database. So this should be much faster. And if we run this, we notice that it returns about, well, 12,000 requests a second, well, almost 13,000. Okay, so we're getting a much higher throughput here, but we're also pushing the CPU load pretty high. And if we look closely here to the CPU load, we also notice that web search is actually generating 20% of overhead. So this is actually impacting the test. So there's a couple of things you can do to minimize the overhead for web search. The first thing is the console. Now the console window is nice when you're running slow requests and it doesn't really have much of an impact, but when you start running these high volume requests that re generate thousands of requests a second, the overhead of actually updating the user interface is intrusive. So you can click this button here, which is a toggle that turns off the console window. So if we run the test again, we should see slightly better performance. And we see here 15,000, 14 and a half thousand requests a second now. So that's about a 10% increase from what we saw before. Now let's stop that and let's go back and run another one of these tests. I'm gonna to toggle the hello world request off and enable the test request, which is a static HTML page. 
Because test.html is a static page, we should see much better result on this one. There's no overhead for IIS to serve a status, static page, and it's actually going to serve that from cache. So let's run this test again, and let's see what we get. We get closer to 30,000 requests a second here. So that's quite a bit faster yet. And so that gives us kind of an idea of where we can actually end up in terms of performance with a totally static request that has almost no overhead. Now, one thing that is important to understand here is, is that the overhead of web search actually is starting to impact the test that we're running here. As far as IIS is concerned, it is going to get starved for actual CPU cycles. So once you start getting into these really high numbers, you need to start thinking about moving the test framework off to another machine. How do we determine how many threads to run? I mentioned here earlier that I was using eight request threads to get the optimum number here. So how did I arrive here? The only way that you really can play around with that is just experiment by using different numbers. So there's also the combination of the delay timeout and the actual request count. So if I double this number now with no delay timeout and I run this test again, you would assume that you might get more requests. But when we actually run the test, we find out that the number actually drops. And the reason for that is, is that these requests are so fast and so close together that the overhead of actually creating more simultaneous HTTP clients outweighs the simple performance of these individual requests. These requests are so fast that they're like one milliseconds or less, and more threats are not actually helping these requests improve in performance. So bumping the number down to eight is actually optimal. The other thing that you need to worry about is, is if you're testing for real load scenarios of real web applications. So if you want to insert a delay of a thousand milliseconds, you can do that here by putting in, for example, a thousand millisecond delay and then running again with eight requests, with eight simultaneous requests. And now you're going to see a very, very slow request time. You're seeing 10 requests a second and we're down from 30,000. So if we stop this, now we need to actually simulate a real user number. And so let's say we say we have 200 users that wait one second between clicks, which is still pretty fast. And if we do this again, now we get 400 requests a second. So as you can see, we can actually accommodate a lot of users here. If you want to run a load test that loads the application to its maximum, run it with no delay. If you want to test it in a real user scenario, then run it with the delay that you think there is actually between the amount of requests that occur. So two seconds is probably pretty typical for a website. And then put in the amount of users that you would like to see on the site at the same time. The bottom line to all of this is that you need to experiment to see what works best for your testing scenarios. Are you looking to load test the application to its maximum when the C word breaks? Or do you really want to simulate your users with the amount of delay time in between requests so that you can simulate an accurate user count. So there's different approaches that you can take and it takes some experimentation to get the test just the way you want it to. But web search makes this pretty easy because you can very easily vary these numbers on a global basis and then simply change these values here and then rerun the test very quickly. The last thing I want to demonstrate is the web search command line. You can access it by typing web search CLI into the command window and web search CLI was installed onto your path so it's always available. So when you do this, you should be able to see a list of all the commands that are available. Okay, so then we can actually run a request here and so we can point it at an individual URL and specify the number of seconds and the simultaneous sessions to run. So in this case, 10 seconds and eight requests, uh, eight requests at a time. So here, this is the test HTML static page in the API sample we looked at earlier. And you can see the numbers are slightly higher than what we were seeing in the web search UI. And that's because there's less overhead in actually serving this information. So here's the result and there is the actual request data. You can also start the CLI against a web search session file. And then also here, just for kicks to do something a little bit different, let's return the result as JSON. So if I let this run, we again see the request rolling through here, but then when it's actually done, after the six seconds that it's running here, it's going to give me a JSON display that shows me the results and actually a lot more detail. So if we scroll up a little bit here, we see the end result is right here. And then it tells us when the test was run, the actual test result, which is the summary. And then each one of the URLs is displayed with the longest run, how many requests total and how many failed. So this is actually quite useful 
and you can integrate that into your build process. Thank you for watching this video on Westwind Web Search. If you want to find out more, come visit us on the web at websearch.west-wind.com. Thank you.